Hi folks and welcome to another episode of Careers and Coffee this Thursday. I'm absolutely thrilled to be welcoming Mark Aaron. Now trying to think about everything that Mark does in the creative industry sector is quite a challenge. I think probably the best way to summarise who he is and what he does is he's an artist and he'll be coming on to talk to us a little bit more about all of the fantastic projects that he's been getting up to throughout his career and what he's up to at the moment. So let's welcome Mark. Hello. Mark, welcome. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. And you? Oh, life, life's pretty good today. That's what, that's what we like. And I can see a bit of sun coming out, which is uh, rare these days, I think. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've been away and I missed all the rain. I envy you. I envy, I envy you a little bit right now. I mean, but yeah, most important question, have you got coffee? I have, right here. We like this and it's nice and hot too. See? Essential items. Yeah. This, this is what we need. This is what we need. Now, yeah, as I was sort of making the introduction, you know, you, you are an artist and you do some brilliant stuff. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Oh, goodness. OK, uh, so uh, I am an artist, uh, although an awful lot of my work has a commercial dimension. Uh, so often I am employed to in a, 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 the context of a graphic designer. Uh, sometimes uh, as an art director, sometimes as a kind of commercials director. Um, uh, I am an animator and an illustrator and oh. and writing music as well to go along with some of the projects. So, you know. So, so talk to me here. So I'm looking at Pie Face. Now, that yeah. is a incredibly popular uh, board game. Now, you know, what was your involvement in that? Uh, the uh, the client came to me and said, uh, I've got this idea for a game um, and I want to kind of slap people in the face with some cream or something like that, and have some kind of random element. Um, can we have a conversation? Can you go away? I'll, I'll pay you for, you know, three or four days to go away and start thinking about how that might work. Um, and then I came back and said, this is how I think it could work. And there were lots of things to think about, like health and safety. You can imagine, you know, you're actually physically forcing an object onto somebody. You know, you can imagine the kind of list of complaints and, and that sort of stuff. So that was a consideration. So then I did some pencil sketches. Once they were approved, I moved to a kind of 3D design, um, which was then from my designs went to, to be manufactured. Um, and then once that, was, that process was uh, ongoing, uh, I then had time to think about logos, illustrations, packaging, uh, any kind of supporting graphic material um, that might go along with it, really. So that, that was that was my involvement with that. that um... That's that's absolutely extraordinary. And yeah. you know, th this is probably a tricky question to answer, given what you do get up to. But what does an average day look like if there is, a, you know, if there is one? There, there kind of is an average day. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, because there are always... Uh, numerous projects on the go of different with that require different sets of skills um, I maintain quite an impressive spreadsheet uh, of every project at what stage it's at who's involved with it how much time has been allocated to it and that kind of gets updated at the beginning of every day and I might start my day by making phone calls um, relevant to the project that I'm working on um, uh, often I'll be working with a company and they will elect uh, a kind of go-between to kind of manage the project because there might be other people involved. Um, and then once that's done, after about um, an hour and a half, uh, I make coffee and then I get, <laughs> then I get busy. And, and, and that busyness can last. Sometimes you wrap up at three or four o'clock in the afternoon and other times you're still there at 11 o'clock at night, you know, it's, um, depending wow. on the project. And depending on what's involved. Um, I mean, you must have to be super organised to be able to balance things so many plates at any given time, no? I, I, I think that's for others to judge. I, I just kind of get on with it uh, and, and also know how to manage um, clients' expectations. Uh, so don't bluff, don't uh, try and over-promise, um, stick within what you know and the boundaries of what you know, but also discuss with your client you know, what's possible uh, and, and you know, in, encourage them to kind of invest in time that's 
not just working, but actually thinking time and research time and and uh, being able to experiment. And I think that's the uh, if if you're lucky enough to get those kind of clients. And I, I'm I'm fortunate where I'm in a situation where I can kind of pick and choose who I work with or who I don't work with. Um, so you know, it, it sounds like I've, it's very complex, but it, it isn't. Um, that's I think that's brilliant advice and I'm also just you yeah, know whilst you're talking I can see lots of cool stuff on your website as well two that I definitely recognize which is countdown and pointless yes so what have you yeah what's your involvement with those uh countdown had a load of graphics um that were made for tv but often what happens is um working in graphic design in television is that the resolution of, of what you appear what appears on screen is not good enough for print uh, so basically, the producers of Countdown came to me and said, can I recreate uh, the, all of the Countdown graphics, uh, but then put my own kind of slant on it, my own spin on it. So I then animated it um, and uh, and then made very, very high res renders of it that then could be used for, say, game packaging or books or any any of those kind of things. So uh, and, and uh, different with, with TV branding, <clears throat> sometimes I get to design the brand from the ground up other times you kind of come in later in the process uh when you're looking at say when when the tv company is saying okay well that's been successful we now want to merchandise it so you know who who's who knows how to do that uh, so my name is some in on someone's list somewhere and i get phone call and and say oh can you can you work on pointless or can you work on uh, countdown or um what have I been working on? I've been working closely with a guy called Stephen Mulhern. I don't know if you know. That name rings a bell, yeah. He, he's a presenter on television. He presents Countdown. He's also on Ant and Dex, uh, Saturday Night Takeaway, uh, and has his own section within there called In for a Penny, which is what I've been working on with him. Yeah. Uh, and also a new show that he put together uh, with Simon Cowell last year, which has only now just been broadcast. We've been sort of like waiting for about 12 months for it to be broadcast, uh, called Rolling In It, which is out on a Saturday night, I believe. It must be so sort of satisfying and fulfilling <laughs> the, all of the work that you're doing to then see it on screen or whether it be in board games or anything. That must, be, <laughs> that must be so cool. I don't watch it. Ah, oh, no, I can't say that. that. You think I would, but but actually um, the, 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 the thrill uh, that you get uh, from seeing your work realised in that way in a commercial context wears off quite quickly. Actually, the, the thrill is in working on it. The thrill is in creating it. And, and then what happens is that once something is actually shown or seen or delivered or is in store or whatever, um, you, you're, you're already three or four projects further on. And, uh, and um, so, so that kind of fades quite quickly. That's fantastic. Well, honestly, if anybody's listening, please don't do it for the glory. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to talk a little bit more about sort of young Mark and yeah, you know, what was school like for you? Did you always have this in mind of thought, yeah, you know, I'm gonna go off, be an animator and do all of this cool stuff? Um, yeah, was that always in your head? And Hold what was your sort of career's advice like that you got? But my career's advice was very blunt. Uh, I, I think I did a questionnaire and they sat down and said, uh, you should be a writer. Okay. That, that, that's what you're scored most highly on. Yeah, you you, sh you should be a writer. But my school life was quite troubled. If I'm completely honest with you, I I, I loved it, but um, uh, I was I was a I, I would say I was quite a high achiever, uh, a very high achiever at school. But I was also quite a, quite a rebel, uh, and the teachers allowed me to get away with an awful lot, <laughs> and uh, which is probably unfair. Um, uh, but uh, I kind of walked away from school aged 15 uh, and I think I did one O level, uh, two O levels and then walked and didn't do any more uh, because I can't, I know this sounds really, I, I think I was really young, angry um, and kind of knew what I wanted to do. My father was a musician and my father had already put me in an orchestra and, and uh, taught me to play guitar. I mean, he quite famously was a, um, a session musician uh, and worked with Bowie and and all sorts of people, and wow. he encouraged me. He he wanted me to be, believe it or not, he wanted me to be a solicitor, and um, and even though I was playing tenor horn in an orchestra and I was doing all this musical stuff, I actually rebelled against being a musician, <laughs> and I actually said no, 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 because I would always be living in my father's shadow. I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to 
go and be an artist in a visual sense, mm. not, not in a, a, a an audio or the music musical sense, you know. And so so that was the it was kind of the whole lot was all about rebelling and, and saying, no, I'm going to go and paint. I'm going to go and create. I'm going to go and design album covers. I'm going to. Yeah. Do so you think you got that sort of creative flair from him, given sort of what he was doing as a career then? That sort of, that sort of brushed um, off on you? I, I don't know. I think I was very, very fortunate. I mean, I was actually raised by my grandparents, actually, if I'm honest with you. And because um, with, with some, because I had some family tragedy in the background and, uh, and they, surrounded me with a very very rich environment of books literature conversations art galleries um and i think it kind of came from them really is that is that you know that they that they prepared the groundwork from a very very early age uh, so i didn't have to fight to kind of do what i'm doing even now if that makes sense yeah it's, no, a, it's a very very natural natural process but you know, I, I, I think um, but my uh, at school, I loved all the sciences and I loved English and I loved mathematics and I still do and I still love all those things. Um, but I definitely excelled in the artistic subjects and paid less attention to the um, kind of technical drawing or computer science or maths or anything like that, even though I was, you know, OK at them. I mean, do, do you think we need to be, do you think there's still a disparity between some of the creative subjects that we're teaching in schools compared to your English, math, science and making sure that they're sort of on a level playing field? Do you think that's sort of still there? It's, it's really interesting because uh, the, I, I would argue that from my own personal perspective, that um, creativity is something that I've created myself or was nurtured to create despite school. If, if that makes sense, you know. So um, it, it, I, I'm not wanting to get too political, but it does trouble me that there is this drive for uh, STEM subjects. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, it's very difficult to put my finger on this. The, um, when you teach, when you learn art at school or you learn a creative dis discipline, what you're actually doing is learning a set of skills. But what they don't teach is how to think and, 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 and the reward of play and the reward of failure, because actually failure is important. <coughs> it teaches us to, um, to know our own boundaries, to, to, to test, to, to uh, you know, you, you can't make everything a success. You, you make a, if, if it's a piece of art or whether it's a piece of technology, you create a prototype and then you kind of try and break it. And, and sometimes you try to say, well, I broke it, it failed, it didn't work. But boy, you learn so much. And that, see, that thinking, that approach seems, and if I'm wrong, forgive me, seems absent um, in uh, the modern curriculum as, as, as it stands now. Uh, you're learning facts and you're learning skills. So you might learn how to animate um, using a computer, using Adobe Animate, or you might use After Effects or, or one of those kind of pieces of software, but they are actually only tools. Yeah. So what they teach you is like, well, this is how it works, but then go away and kind of develop your own fantasy kind of landscape or way of approaching projects to make you think sideways and not in the same way that everybody else is thinking. They don't teach you the, the beauty of that, if that makes sense. That's, uh, that, yeah, that's that's very good advice. So next question. So someone's obviously looking at all the cool stuff on the screen. So how do you get involved in all of these projects? And how can I, as someone in school, do the same? Uh, it literally is um, uh, just sticking around long enough, I think. <laughs> just, just hanging around long enough and, and eventually, and, and try and position yourself. I mean, it is networking. It is... Um, um you know getting a job uh in a tv studio um and then kind of developing your own skills or, and sometimes being in a situation where you put your hand up and say i can do that mm -hmm. oh, oh we've got a problem we're, we're filming this documentary and we need a shot that does this uh but we haven't got the budget and then you can turn and say i know how to do that and you just get noted you get recognized and oh can i have your contact details can i have your linkedin details and then somebody eventually picks up the phone and, and you develop that network, you know. And, and you, I, you touch on, 
You touch on LinkedIn there. I mean, how important is it for anyone aspiring to do what you do that they need to be on social media and they need to be putting out the right message maybe to it's, it's interesting because i say my, my website is like i think it's actually four years old and i've got a new one going up next week I'd love, um we'll hide this one <laughs> okay please <laughs> and uh I, I don't think my website my, my website is there to turn around to new clients to turn and say to them oh yeah mark's for real it, it exists but yeah. beyond that, it has no function. I don't think anybody looks at my website and says, oh, I'm going to call Mark. It, it's almost like a, a corporate brochure, if that makes sense. It's, um, oh, yeah, he's real. That, 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 that's the role of it. And LinkedIn, um, I've, I have very little to do with LinkedIn or very, um, it, as I say, it, the, the, the best way of getting work is by word of mouth still. Yeah however beautiful your website is or however amazing your you know your, your, your work is you know it's it's when somebody says oh yeah get give this guy a call or you know he did this yeah. for me and, and that's that's still the best way i mean just just on that so, you know whilst we're talking about some of your work you know what skills do you use day to day um to be able to support what you do oh my goodness um so graphic designer artist illustrator animator composer director um yeah, that that all of that really, but but again, and and also computer skills, um, time management skills, self discipline, all of those kind of things. You you need a. a, a is, is that something? Yeah. Are some of those skills? Have you always had them, or have you had to sort of adapt and learn? I've had to fail yeah. along the way. No, <laughs> absolutely. You know, I've I, you know, I, I remember my first couple of graphic design jobs. I you know, I got fired. Um, you know, quite unceremoniously because, you know, I really was too big for my boots. You know, I, I really, I really did want to change the world with graphic design, art, music, and all the rest of it. Um, and to the uh, best of it. <laughs> and, and then, of course, you know, you've got a creative director that's turned around and said, no, I just want you to draw a picture of a, a chicken. <laughs> well, I mean, Have you? chickens aside, I know you've been sort of, working on something quite interesting. So I know you featured on The Apprentice, the sort of the design guru. Yes, you know, did you get to meet Lord Sugar? And you know, what was that process like? Uh, it was okay. Uh, I think we were, I, I was approached, uh, they wanted to do a number of programs about how to develop product. So not okay. just, not just um, be entrepreneurial in terms of how to sell something, but actually how to think, how to come up with ideas, how to test those ideas. Um, so they phoned me up and said, you know, would you act as a consultant um, to uh, the teams, uh, the candidates? Uh, so I then wrote, I worked with the producers of the show uh, and wrote a brief, which Alan Sugar then read out at the, at the beginning of the show. And then I worked with the candidates while they were brainstorming and being filmed. So I was on TV as well um, and talking them through you know how to how to think how to how to make product how to make an idea from you know the back of a fag packet to or a whiteboard um That's to really realizing in a commercial context so uh, I'm, I'm glad you helped them sort of to think because i think a lot of them do need to do that on that show now and then um <laughs> yes, they're all very nice actually they're, they're all they're all super people oh, um, i didn't get to meet lord sugar but i did work quite closely with Karen Brady um, okay, that's cool. and one of her teams, so, um, which went on to win, I believe. Or oh, one of them. Yeah. Win winning team, that's, that's the good one. Now, I mean, <laughs> to talking about teams, now, you have got a racing team of Huskies, is that uh -huh. correct? Yes, that's right, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I don't know where to start with that. Um, how? Why? Um, yeah. Talk so about it's, a, it's a long story, but I mean, I've, very, very briefly, um, about eight years ago, uh, some friends of ours uh, had, in an unfortunate situation, had had a young husky pup that they couldn't house, and the RSPCA couldn't house them either. And we had a cocker spaniel, and they said, "Oh, can you look after this husky pup for a weekend? Because you've got crates and you've got food and you've got blankets and all the rest of it." And of course, the, the the husky arrived, and and he was absolutely adorable. Um, and our children, who have now left home, grown up and left home, uh, were at home at the time, and they just went, "Oh no, he's staying, 
is staying. And then we quickly learned that a husky on its own is not happy. So we had to get another one. And then, and, then friends. <laughs> and, and, then, and then we started investigating that there was this local husky community and that they all race their dogs on sleds through forests and all the rest of it. And we gradually got involved in that community and, and have been acquiring a couple of huskies every couple of years. So how many huskies have you got now? Eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, blimey. Um, that, that's really interesting. So uh, we've just got a, uh, a question in. So which of your projects are you the most proudest about? That's, that, that, that's an interesting, I've, I, I've got two, I, I will mention two. One of them still opens an awful lot of doors for me um, in terms of, you know, commercial, commercially. And that is all the design work I did on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wrote the branding Bible for 88 different countries um, for when it was televised. So that, that, was, a, that was a big job. And, and even now when people say, oh, you know, what has Mark designed? And I say, oh, well, you know, he did the logo for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. That still somehow opens so many doors it's ridiculous but if i'm honest with you the the project i'm most proudest of um was a campaign uh that i was involved with and there was only 10 core well, about 15 no, was about 15 core members of it um about 10 years ago and we mounted a big campaign on social media using facebook um to save a radio station okay. and it was the campaign to save bbc radio six music uh, which was 10 years ago now, and the government, the, the incoming Cameron government were intent on closing this kind of cultural institution, which at the time only had about a million listeners, but they were real hardcore kind of music fans, art appreciators, all the rest of it. And uh, we, we put a successful campaign together. Uh, we organised gigs. We organised tube posters. We contacted bands. We had Radiohead and Razorlight and Coldplay sending us videos in support, which we were then leaking to The Guardian um, uh, on a regular basis to kind of keep the profile up. And I think at one point we had something like 200,000 Facebook supporters on the group. And I think it was the first time it had ever been done, whether the first time that social media, Twitter and Facebook together mm. had, had a campaign that was absolutely really strongly coordinated uh, and you know we we proved uh, through research that we did and commissioned ourselves that for every pound that the BBC was spending on supporting um, keeping the radio station open that it was actually creating 13 pounds spent in the UK economy from people going to gigs buying records buying merchandise um, and, and all the rest of it so we proved that and we delivered all that information to the head of the BBC Trust um, uh, with um, in a meeting with Tim Davey, who's now uh, BBC Director General, um, who, was de who, who was one of the ones that wanted to close it. Um, but he's now Director General, so I, I don't know where we go now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but, but we, we kept it alive and, and uh, I'm very proud of that. I, I think we, we really did a thing. That, that, was, a, that was a moment where our art, our graphic design skills, our, you know, kind of media knowledge and all the rest of it and all our contacts just came together quite beautifully to, to deliver a solution. And, and it was, you know, I'm very proud of it. That's astonishing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now, I know that, you you know, you believe that creativity is a sort of driving force of, in effect, in, of innovation. Um, can you expand on that a little bit more? Well, I think I think the problem is the word creativity. I mean, I, I, I think there is. Uh, I think we're all creative. I think we're all. Um, uh, I think a lot of people are put off thinking that they are creative. I think as children we learn to play. Uh, we learn uh, as as we get older. Being playing is kind of then therefore somehow frowned on, or people are told that they are not creative, or some people get told. Oh, you can draw. He's so creative. And actually, in fact, drawing is not is not what makes creativity. That that means all drawing is is being able to look at something and go, oh yeah, and then mechanically recreate it. That's not necessarily creativity. So the idea of what creativity is is misused all over the place. 
I, I would say that what creativity is, is this ability to have a lot of knowledge of the zeitgeist or, or the, the, the landscape that you're in, um, and then being able to look at where it is at the moment, what the trends are and that sort of stuff, and then just kind of look at it in a, in a way from a position, from a perspective that nobody else has, so that you, you're not really light years ahead, because if you're light years ahead, people will reject it. You have to just kind of be like a surfer almost, kind of on the on the tip of the wave the whole time. You can't be out in front, way in front of the wave. You can't be left in its wake. You've just got to kind of ride it the whole time. And that's that a, a set of skills which aren't taught anywhere um, and should be, if they could be. Really, I think everybody who start I mean scientists doctors should study that and artists should study science and they should study mathematics and not be separated and pigeonholed in in and streamed the way we are so easily at a young age that's um, really interesting because my next question uh, and I'll come on to that one shortly but my next question is how do you get people who are in I don't know they might think oh, I'm in a fairly boring office environment how can you get them to apply that creativity in, well, in the environment they're in? That, that, that's interesting because you, you don't really want every job to be creative. I don't want my heart surgeon to be creative. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want, to, I don't want to meet a, a, creative, um, a creative nightclub doorman, for example. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, no. But, there, but there, are, there are certain jobs, certainly if you're in industry, certainly if you're... Uh, in an office environment, uh, the creative role might just be thinking about how it could work better. Is, is there a better way that everybody could work? Why are the systems that we're currently using, have they evolved because somebody thought about them or have they evolved, uh, evolved organically and actually different personalities and that have interrupted the natural flow of things and it's not quite working and some people that guy sits in the corner and he's not happy and he's only productive half of the time and then you've got the next person over here who's definitely going to be promoted but they're going to be promoted because they uh their their goal is not to do their job their goal is to be promoted um and then you've got other people who are very very good at their job that need to stay there because nobody wants them being promoted because they're doing such a good job you stay right where you are so you've got all, even in an office environment, you've got all those kind of mix of characters and personalities and that, which sometimes if you're an office manager or if you have some sense of responsibility for your sort of working day and your the people that you work with, um, thinking about it, you might not come to a solution and actually you might uh, find out that the solution that you've arrived at is the best you possibly can already, but creativity has a role to play. When it comes to industry, um, I know loads of people who are physicists and engineers and, and that sort of stuff. <coughs> and we have quite long conversations about what they're doing and ways in which to kind of undo the log jam of the logic they're bound up in, yeah. you know, to actually, again, think from a different position. You know, I'm here, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. What happens if I discount X, Y, and Z and just look at the problem from this point of view or, or from that point of view? So creativity has a role to play, but it's really just a way of thinking, a set of tools to uh, to uh, an approach, a methodology. Good answer, like that. Definitely not a creative heart surgeon, so I want that. I am going to close on this next question because it's very topical at the moment. So, Musicians, actors, and many in creative sectors are facing a hard time because of COVID at the moment and being told to retrain. How do you envision this sector continuing? Uh, do you mean the sector of retraining or, or, or the, the current, I'm assuming the current creative? I'm going to say the current creative. I, I think, I, I'm hoping um, that once this pandemic has passed its peak, that there is going to be an explosion of creativity. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because in lockdown, the, the use of art 
was massive. You know, subscriptions to Netflix, books read, all the rest of it went through the roof. I mean, you can turn around and say, well, yeah, musicians, actors, and other people in the creative sector are facing a hard time. I actually think politically that the, the government should support that sector um, and they should. it brings in, not that there's always economic arguments to things, but if you want to apply an economic argument, um, uh, the creative sector is something like the third largest sector of industry in the UK. Uh, why the government is somehow suddenly ignoring it, I can only assume is that they have no vested interest in supporting it, uh, which seems a great shame. However, uh, just because you're working in Tesco's, believe it or not, doesn't mean you're not an artist and you're still an artist and you're still an actor. So I think the, the uh, sector will endure um, and it's a real shame that it's a hard time on the sector. Um, but I think coming out of it, there will be an explosion of, um, uh, of, of the creative arts. I mean, believe me or not, you, you, if you're in lockdown, um, I, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I looked at the um, the NPD figures uh, for Waterstones recently because I'm doing a couple of projects with Waterstones, um, and um, Waterstones have had the largest, the biggest year since Harry Potter was released. So the appetite for reading books and consuming Audible or consuming uh, literature is, is high at the moment. It's really high. I think the problem, but the the person that wrote that might be addressing is the live music industry and the live theatre industry. And that's really tough. That's really tough, but I think it will endure. No, I, Mark, that's a brilliant answer. Thank you so much. Yeah, I could sit here for hours and talk to you because I've learned so much during this call and I feel inspired by it. So okay. thank you. A huge, huge thank you for coming on to Careers and Coffee today. No, it's a pleasure. And uh, it's lovely to talk to you and uh, hopefully, um, somebody might be inspired and kind of go off and have a crazy lopsided career like I've had. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So folks, that was Mark Aaron. Um, I mean, how, how do you sum that up? Watch it back. Um, fantastic, inspiring leader um, in the creative sector. So huge, huge thanks to Mark for coming on to Careers and Coffee today. Um, as always, we have a survey. It takes 20 seconds to fill in. It's in the link below. Um, helps Josie and I come up with awesome new guests. Um, so make sure you go on there and fill it in so we can make more informed decisions about how we do careers and coffee. So that's the end of this week's careers and coffee. Next week we have on CJ Green. So CJ is our new chair here at New Anglia Lep. So she's going to be talking to us about her plans for New Anglia, how we're going to rebuild the economy moving forward. So be sure to tune in to CJ 12.30 at 